kryptonite, a power known to weaken or harm you, leaving a path of destruction through your entire existence. Some minds are already free, while many are still trapped, afraid to follow the voice inside. Fear of failure continues to tie you down. For too long you've allowed your perceived limitations to hold you back. But, what if there was a way to obliterate your kryptonite? To overcome your self-doubt, imposter syndrome, and fear of what if? And how big would your impact be if these didn't exist? To help you on your gifted journey, your next set of extraordinary masters are ready. A world-renowned transformational speaker who's considered one of the architects of the personal growth industry. A best-selling author and clinical psychologist with over 5 million followers. Who will help you answer the question, how do I overcome my kryptonite? I'll start by saying welcome. My name is Giovanni. I am the founder of Archangel and the host of The Gifted Show. Welcome to this live recording of the show. And I've spoken to so many of you. And when we talk, especially people in our community, um, and we speak around the dreams we want to manifest and, and the things we want to create and the impact we want to have and the people we want to help. And every single one of these conversations leads to some form of what I call kryptonite. So if you haven't heard that word before, kryptonite is the uh, element that weakens Superman in the comic books. And for us, it's often related to some language that you would all use like self-sabotage or imposter syndrome or a limiting belief or uh, trauma or fear. And these things, whatever it is for you, it's getting in the way of you creating the impact you want to create and for you to dream, sometimes to dream at all, but to dream or dream bigger and most importantly, to realize that dream where the dream is connected to helping other people. And I keep thinking, imagine what the world would be like if we could crush this kryptonite. How many people would be impacted in a positive way? How much good can we all do? How much change can we all make? And I want to solve that now in the next 90 minutes. We're going to do this. So I thought, who better to invite to, into this conversation than the, my two friends who are the best in the world at this conversation? So I want to welcome David Nagel and Dr. Nicola Perra. Welcome, David and Nicole. Thank you. Glad to be here. And David, why don't we start with you? When we talk about this kryptonite, what are we actually talking about? Paradigms, mostly. Um, meanings that were given to us that, uh, that we, have, we have, for whatever reason, decided to believe that that's the way that the world works. And not understanding that there's, that there's something different, whether it's a, a meaning or a possibility um, or an idea. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to watch how fast... Um, the world is changing in difficult ways because people are locked into meanings that, that aren't necessarily true, but they're just made up meanings. And, uh, you know, I mean, people even taking words, they don't even know the etymology of a word and they, and they make a word mean what they want it to, 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 to mean. And the problem is, is that it gets stuck in a reality that they create for themselves. It's not necessarily true, but nevertheless, they live in that reality. So they live as if it is true. And then that creates a, a, a dynamic where um, you have more than one person living within that reality. <clears throat> it's like uh, an agreed upon non-truth, uh, where then you have people combating and uh, arguing or even debating over things that don't have any basis in truth. They have basis in 
uh, pain, misconceptions, uh, old beliefs, things that no longer exist, and a lot and, and tremendous misunderstanding. Um, uh, that that uh, the the amount of misunderstanding that I think people glom onto is fascinating and one of my uh, real concerns is that we're we are quickly becoming a world without a purpose and because we have so many people in our world that have number one they don't know how to find their own individual purpose in life um, but they don't have a purpose if you're if you're really thinking about what is it that human beings do to stay alive? One of the things that we do is we find a purpose. And if we can't find our own purpose, we will find any purpose that fits our own bias generally, which is dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. Uh, because if there's no truth in that bias, or if there's, if there's falsehood in that bias, or there's um, uh, harm, excuse me, harm in that bias, uh, a person will fight to stay hooked to it to the death because that's what human beings do. They, they get locked into a purpose, whether it's real or it's just imagined. And I, I think that's what that kryptonite is right now in this, at this point in history where people are very much locked into a purpose that's not real. Uh, but because they don't know how to find their own, they will follow anything. Yeah, that's so true. And I, I think there's a connection between purpose and hope. And I think sometimes people get disconnected from hope. There's um, one of my favorite movies ever, and allow me to be a nerd for a second, is X-Men Days of Future Past. I love comic books, I love superheroes. And I love it because my favorite superhero is Professor X, the leader of the X-Men. And I'm, I think I'm the only person who says this. And in that film, young Professor X is telepathically speaking to old Professor X because young one is struggling and he's feeling all this pain. And old Professor X says, we need you to hope again. And it, it reminds me of this idea that you've lost connection with purpose and yet you can take on all this pain and transmute it into something that shifts it from a curse to a gift. Nicole, what about you? How would you define the kryptonite? Absolutely. So I'm going to build off of um, David, your definition, um, starting with this concept of meaning, because I very much agree um, in terms of the kryptonite, the language I use is what keeps us stuck. Um, because back when I was a clinical psychologist, I had a practice and that was the number one word that came up week after week, incredible amounts of insight people would have coming into session, yet they can't change. So why is it we can't change? Why are people stuck? Very similarly, when we think about meaning, I think about where does it come from? And I talk a lot about our past experiences, the meanings that we're assigning now well into adulthood. For many of us, that means we're well distant from our past in years. We might even be living in a different location around a different cast of characters, yet we're still carrying those earliest meanings with us. We have a very deep part of our mind that's called the subconscious. And that becomes where we store all of our past experiences. So again, even though we grow in age, we, we mature in a lot of different ways, we shift, we change our environments, we're still stuck because we're still assigning the old meanings based again very, on very real experiences that we once had as in, as in childhood, as children. So now I'm going to piggyback this concept to two other things I heard you say, right? Purpose and hope. What happens to a lot of us when we're assigning these old meanings, when we're living with pain in our subconscious and all of the adaptations, all of the things we did to survive, we become an adult who not only are we assigning meanings that don't serve us, at least, and I'll speak from my own lived experience, some of us purpose is just a concept out there. I'll be the first to say when I started to hear this word purpose and passion, I had no idea what people were talking about. I felt so disconnected again, based on my past experiences of survival led me to not even having idea what a purpose was, let alone hope. Um, and a lot of us, like I said, are carrying our kryptonite, our past experiences with us in a very real way and are keeping ourselves not only stuck, so many of us are keeping ourselves disconnected from our true purpose, 
feeling more and more hopeless and more and more disempowered over time. David, are we addicted to our past? Very much so. Well, you know, that's a really interesting question. I think we're addicted to safety. So in, in, in the mind of, like when Nicole's talking about with the subconscious mind, the idea is that we will literally give up truth for safety every day of the week. Most people will. Um, because they don't know how to think, you know, I mean, we're not raised in an environment where we get a user manual to our mind. So we're taught how to think generationally based on the people that are that were around and socially, and then the meanings that that they have are uh, very much dependent on how they experience life, and whether or not that was painful or pleasurable. Um, but those stories, the interesting thing about those stories, because we, when I'm so when I say story, I'm referring to your comment about the past, yeah. they give us some semblance of control. And when we feel we have control, it makes us feel safer than if we're exploring something that's new, even if it, even if it might be something that's great, but we don't, we don't feel a sense of control over it. So it doesn't allow us to feel safe at the same time. Is safety then an illusion? Oh, it's totally an illusion. There's no such thing as safety. Safety is our ability to be able to think based on cause and effect and to understand how to respond consciously uh, in a moment. But most people think of safety as a destination, right? I would think Nicole probably totally agree with that. It's as of a destination, like I'm constantly looking for a place to land where everything is safe. And we know that that's not, that's not true. It doesn't exist. Well, David, you use the word consciously. Nicole, what is, what does it mean to be conscious? What is consciousness? consciousness is, yeah, consciousness is grounded in the present moment and what's happening here and now. Um, so many of us, again, we're living in that past very much like David, you're offering. We are as humans, I mean, one of the ways we've evolved was to find safety, to create safety, to keep our physical bodies safe. Now, this is the caveat here. We have to understand that safety, according to our minds or our subconscious, equals familiarity, doesn't actually objectively mean safety. This is why so many of us are stuck in cycles that actually have a whole bunch of consequences and We probably have very well-meaning loved ones around us yelling those consequences at us, yet according to our subconscious, that's all we know. That becomes so familiar that we are locked because we do gravitate toward the safety and that predictability, like David was saying, because we gain a sense of control. We know what comes next. It might be a terrible outcome, though I know what comes next. So like you're saying, David, safety, I agree, isn't a destination. It's not actually something external at all we find that internally. And one of the greatest gifts we can give ourselves to create that safety is through a practice of consciousness. Because most of the difficulty, our our stuck patterns are living in our subconscious mind. Again, based in our past, not what's actually in front of us. So the more we learned how to become conscious, what does that mean? Ground it in the present moment. I always profess a consciousness check-in. Take a moment to really feel what it is to be here in this moment. How does this chair feel? How is my body and my heart rate feeling right now? Now I'm present to what's here. I'm not in that past that for many of us we're dragging along with us. I'm present in the moment. And only then, again, to speak to your point, David, very beautiful, can I begin to be responsive? I don't have to rely on those older reactions that we already know the consequences that play out. Chances are they don't serve us. Now in this present moment, if I'm conscious, I can shift into responsiveness. I actually get to choose what I do. And that gives me a little more control over what happens next. I love that word responsive and the word responsibility. Uh, I've seen people break it down to having the ability to respond. And David, I, for both of you, I think we have to time travel a little. And what I mean by that is um, often the place people are afraid of is to go backward and to address what happened, or at least to heal that part that is showing up in in the present day version of you that's affected by the stories from back then. And David, I heard you speak about the idea of a core 
fear or maybe core wound. Can you share your interpretation? Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, it, you know, as as a little child is is developing, one of the things that people don't uh, realize, and it's probably because it's just it isn't talked much unless you took psych classes in in school. There is a very real time in an infant's life where life and death was very real, and it was it was very prominent. It was there on a regular basis, and without having a mother or father or close caregiver a child's life is, you know, it's, it's not going to last a child will, a child will die. So what does that do? It subconsciously, the, the mind knows that the child is vulnerable. It needs to adapt to that environment uh, pretty rapidly. And we're not, you know, we're born linguistically challenged, right? So we're responding to feeling, we're responding to uh, emotion, we're responding to tone of voice. Like we learn tonally, before we learn language, you know, we can, we understand um, when, when mom is in a good mood, a bad mood, when she's receptive, when our communication is getting across, when, when our needs are, are getting met. And through a process of time, what ends up happening is we have experiences where our needs don't get met for whatever reason. It doesn't mean that mom was bad or dad was bad. It just means that there were times when our needs were not getting met uh, and not getting met for various different reasons. So how a child internalizes that over that period of time really determines how much they feel that they need um, love and, and, and appreciation and responsiveness from, from other human beings. And we then develop patterns. And the patterns are the amazing way that human being has to adapt to getting our needs met. So we notice things very quickly. We notice that if I do this, if I do A and mom does B, I get my need met. If I do A and mom does C and I don't get my need met, I need to change. I need to develop a different pattern. So one of the filters that we create as a child is uh, a filter of seeing the world through a negative uh, perception. Of, and, and you can call it a wound. Uh, core wound is, is something that, that's, that's batted around quite a bit. And the two main core wounds are feeling unlovable and feeling unworthy. And again, this is a pattern based on how you did or did not get your, your need met. So when a child grows up and they have this negative filter, it does not mean that they're disordered. It does not mean that there's something seriously wrong. What it means is that just as we have a positive filter for seeing the world, we also have a negative filter. And the negative filter can keep us alert to when things are not right, possibly when we're not safe. It can keep us alert to the, um, uh, the, 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 the patterns and the ideas of people that we may not want to associate with. Um, and one of the ways that we become alert to that is through our own anger. So when certain things that happen in life to us upset us, the reason that we're getting upset is because we're defending something. And as we learn that there's, that there's something underneath that defense mechanism, the one thing that we're learning is that there is a part of our unconscious mind that does not want to go back and experience pain, so to speak, that we may have, have experienced as a child, which, you know, I call those uh, core wounds. But what, we, what most people don't realize is just how many decisions are made in avoidance of those, even if the avoidance is no longer real. So, one of the things that I like to explain is that, you know, we developed certain patterns to be able to survive our childhood. But then when we become adults, we no longer need those same patterns because there, there's a major significant difference that we have as an, as an adult that we didn't have as a child. As a child, we were not the authority of our own life, right? There was somebody else that was in authority around us. But as an adult, we're supposed to be the authority of our own life, but if we were not literally consciously walked through the transfer of power, so to speak, where we understood we were taking authority over our own life and now our choices were our own, 
unconsciously, we still make decisions based on the idea that somebody else is the authority. And if I make the wrong decision, I might be unloved, or I might not be validated. And that's very painful for a child. And it's something that we protect if it's not healed as an adult. Wow. We'll get back to that because I want to talk about how to heal that before. Sure. Nicole, I want to, I know you do a lot of, uh, you share a lot on the idea of, of your inner child. Can you explain or, or tell us more about the inner child and our relationship to them? So the inner child is the aspect of our past, as far as I see it, that is stored in that subconscious. So what do I mean? Very much like David was saying, we're born as humans completely dependent upon other humans to survive. So just like you very beautifully explained, David, we adapt, we modify, we, sh we are very attuned to the environment around us and we learn. We learn what things to suppress and what things that are okay or safe to express. This is emotions. This means how we even physically take care of ourselves. All of this is being modeled to us and we're being impacted. I saw a question come in um, asking whether or not the timeline of when does this start? The specific question was, can it begin in the womb? My opinion is yes, right? We're in the womb of a human who has all of that conditioning, who might even have thoughts and beliefs about us, their new baby in their wound, all impacting us, right? So we, we grow, we modify, we're now alive. We have all of these relationships that we need. We modify these parts of ourselves and we continue to march forward in adulthood. And again, because that's all sort of our subconscious mind, all of the habits and patterns, again, that we've learned to care for ourselves, a lot of this doesn't even happen directly. I loved when you said transfer of power. Few of us are actually taught directly how to care for ourselves and then internalize that process. Meaning at one time we couldn't tell when we were having a need, we cried. And then if we had an attuned caregiver, they arrived on the scene, tried to help figure out or figured out for us what was wrong either fed us or birthed us, and then our need was met. Over time, the transfer of power is teaching us to do that, right? Teaching our own self to monitor our distress and then to be able to identify, oh, my body needs something. Oh, emotionally, I need to do something. And because so few of us have that, what we end up doing is living from that subconscious part of our mind and bypassing a lot of the needs. If we didn't learn how to care for our physical bodies, if we had parents who weren't emotionally attuned and therefore couldn't teach us how to navigate our own emotional world, all of that pain and all of that wounding lives inside of our subconscious mind and comes out, just like you were describing, David, in anger, in reactivity, in again, these habits and patterns that don't serve us even though we feel so driven because there are familiar to keep repeating them. I sometimes feel like our bodies are a vehicle. I love analogy. So imagine our bodies or your body is a bus and there's always someone driving the bus. And that person driving the bus is, uh, you know, so you have biological you, which is, is the bus. Um, emotional you, depending on how old you are emotionally can be driving the bus. And in these states, when something happens that triggers these uh, past scenarios, whether it was traumatic or however people want to identify it, sometimes it's eight-year-old you driving the bus. And I feel like we all see this happening to other people, maybe not as much realizing it's happening to us, but it's like there are often uh, 30, 40, and 50 year olds walking around with eight and 10 year olds driving those buses. And you, you see almost the physicality of people change, their voices change, their attitudes change, their demeanor changes. And I'm curious, does that mean that there is a, an element of, of pain or, or something that happened that needs healing? Um, not that it, it could go away, but you're almost detached from or being anchored to that pain in, in an attempt to avoid that pain. Like let, let's start talking about how to make little you feel good and realizing that you are not little you, you're current you, <laughs> and there's a distinction. I, I remember, uh, and I'll give this quick analogy, working with 
um, uh, a therapist. And out of that, out of these sessions, came up with this cool visualization that's actually been super impactful for me, where I, if I feel anything bubbling up that feels like anxiety or any of those kinds of things, I envision me as a baby in my crib when I was a baby. And now don't laugh, the Avengers are all standing around my crib. So there's Thor and Iron Man and Hulk and me, old, like adult me, present day me, standing with them as a superhero. And we're protecting that baby and no one's gonna fucking touch that baby. And I know it sounds hilarious, that visualization completely alleviates that whatever's bubbling up. And I'm curious, um, David, we'll start with you. How do you advise or, or direct people to first understand what the pattern is and then how to heal or break free or move forward? This is such a really good question. Um, I think that we end up with, so I look at it as there's generally two major core wounds and they usually end up, like I said, with the idea of being uh, unloved or or not worthy. Those are, those are very much tied to the way we interacted with our parents. And like Nicole said, that th this idea that so much of this happens at such, at such young age, I too believe that a lot of it can happen while we're uh, in utero, you know, before we're born, there's so much that we're actually exposed to. But I think that because, and I've thought about this an, an awful lot over the years and, and with my own clients really delved into this, what would be this fear that's actually taking place? Because we know that we're basically born only with two natural fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. All other fears are learned. So if there was something else, what would it be and why would it be there? Well, we do know that because we had the vulnerability of death, that we had to have the parents interacting with us and we had to know that we were like, like if even if you're, you're looking at the biology of, uh, of a human being and how uh, life evolves, there has to be some knowledge, some recognition on a cellular level that that communication is actually happening. Like we're making progress. We know that we're moving in the right direction. But if we're not moving in the right direction, then we're going to develop a core fear. And if you're thinking about, well, what would a core fear be and why would it be there? Well, I think the idea is what would we be most susceptible to as a baby? Our parents leaving. So abandonment, right? The, the, it would have to be something so biologically and genetically strong that we could literally change the behavior of a parent to get our need met. It would have to be the threat of abandonment at that age. And then I think on a surface level, we have something that is the initial filter for us to see through. And that would be, what is a core negative belief that we see through? And, and it's really easy to, to find out the core negative belief, because if you ask somebody, do this little exercise, and you could do this as soon as we're done, you could write this down. Ask yourself, what are five things that other people do to me that really piss me off? Now, here's the key with this. It's not five things that you see people do to other people or five things that you see people do to animals. It's five things directly done to you. So like maybe if a person ignores you or, or somebody tells you what to do or somebody objectifies you or something that they're doing directly to you. So it's involving them in you. And for whatever reason, it just makes you really angry you will find that there is, there is something that flows through those things that is a commonality. And that commonality is directly tied to the idea of whatever that deepest fear would be. Now, here's something fascinating about the subconscious mind. It doesn't want you to solve that problem. And the reason that it doesn't is because it's not based on logic. 
right? It's based on the idea of it figured out a pattern to keep you alive at your most vulnerable stage of life. And if that was not healed, if that was not transferred over and, and emotionally matured as you became your own adult, then it still maintains that pattern. And it doesn't know how else to accomplish that goal. So it literally works through that filter. And that's why we'll say, you know, I don't know. I've, that's just the way that I am. I just always get pissed <laughs> off when people do this. This is just the way that I am. And they don't realize that it's actually a survival pattern that they that they developed at a very young age, at a, at a core uh, age that they were extremely vulnerable and they only had one way of, of literally protecting themselves. So through the adaptation of literally learning how to manipulate our parents to get the needs met, we will then develop that, that core fear. So you have to then trick your biology? Like what, what is no, you know, actually you don't, what you have to do is you have to, so if there's a trick that's going to happen, so there's a process that I'll take people through so that they could actually see what their core wound is, what their core fear is, and what the core negative belief is that is at the surface that they're actually filtering through. What we then do, and, and Gio, you've seen me do this, where we literally have people replace the lie that is built into the excuse that they're making based on the, how they make decisions in life, replace it with the truth. But the way that it's changed internally, subconsciously is through behavioral change. So you're literally linking up the new truth to the new behavior that gives you the result that you want. So you're not repeating the negative pattern and through the constant space of repetition of that new behavior, along with the con the, 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 the conscious understanding of the truth, it's changed and it can change really quick. It's when we're unconscious about it that causes the worst problem because we don't know what's controlling it. And we think that that's how we are. I mean, that's, we think that's yeah. exactly how we are because we don't, have an, we don't have a logical explanation for it. We're like, well, I was like this. And very often we'll also see this one. And I'm sure Nicole's seen this too. Well, my mom was like that. My father was like that, right? It runs in my family. Well, yeah, because, because the, the lineage of, that, of those patterns runs in the family. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a behavioral link. It's actually a subconscious uh, link. So if, uh, Nicole, if there's a piece missing from childhood where we didn't have our needs met, how do we as adults become the parents that we wish we had? Yeah, to, so absolutely. To ourselves. I, I think, yeah, I think I believe that most of us do have, right, some need that's going unmet um, in whatever direction it is. And to go back to this idea, right, when we have a big feeling, we're usually are relying on the only way, like David was saying, that we could tend, could have tended to that need in our earliest environment. Our reactions into adulthood usually are some version of a nervous system response, some version of fighting. I'm yelling, I'm screaming, I'm saying things I don't mean to my loved ones, right? That's the version of a fight response. Maybe I'm fleeing. If you're like me, I'm dissociating, I'm numbing, I'm distancing, right? All of these, again, were the only thing I could do at one time in childhood, yet even though I've developed, I've matured, I have many other ways I can now tend to my emotions, I'm still reliant on those pieces. And with that, I believe, and I've worked with a lot of humans that carry a lot of shame, right? So back to this idea, because I do agree that there's this core wound in a lot of us of I'm not worthy, I'm not lovable. At one time, the only way we could understand developmentally the fact that our needs weren't being met was through a fault of our own. We didn't have the maturity to understand that our parents are separate humans with their own lineages and their own conditioning and have stressful jobs and come home and can't meet our needs of no fault of our own. Our developmentally immature mind can only say, it's because I'm bad, I'm not worthy. Now, right, I act in shameful ways as an adult. I'll use myself as an example. I scream, I yell. I detach, I still go away on my spaceship. And what do I feel afterward? I feel very shameful. I, I wonder why I'm saying and doing things that I don't mean that are hurting the ones I love, yet I can't change. So one of the major shifts 
in my practice. And I love your question, Giovanni. Do you have to trick your body? One of the major reasons I went from working traditionally as I once did, just doing talk therapy to working now holistically is because I understand that the body is absolutely playing a role, especially when it's dysregulated, especially when our nervous system, as some of ours is, is locked in fight or flight, or maybe is so overwhelmed. If you're like me, I was always fleeing. I was always on my spaceship. And if you're in that camp, as a lot of us are, if that wounding is what you're carrying with you from your childhood, there's only so much that positive thinking, conscious awareness can do. Many of us do need to implement the body tools. We do need to change our physiology. Like you're saying, David, we do need to practice a new way of being. And with some of, for some of us, that means shifting our physiology, downshifting maybe from fight or flight, or if we're locked in shutdown, learning how to stimulate our nervous system. Because those of us that are locked in a, in a body reaction, right? You can send the signals down that, you know, this is not fact, I'm in the present moment. And if you're not then sending calming signals up from your body, it's gonna only, you're gonna still remain stuck. I wanna share a bit of my story and then uh, have the two of you figure out what I did, <laughs> right? So. 20 years ago, uh, I went through a lot of, and I'll use words that people would recognize, uh, depression or anxiety, a ton of panic attacks. One that was so severe, I called an ambulance thinking I was having a heart attack. And I've faced that. There was a day where I contemplated suicide. March 27th, 2008, I had that date stuck. Um, now I love myself and I don't just say it as a weird thing to say. I truly, I can look at myself in the mirror with, with like a smile. I never could do that before. And I've done a lot of work over the past 10 years. I want to figure out what the heck I did so that we can all share it with everybody here because I want people to feel like I feel today. Part of that, and I can only describe this now, I couldn't have described this to you even a year ago or five years ago. There is a maturing process that happens where for the first time, like I'm I actually, I don't even know how old I am, 44 or 45, I always forget my age. Um, I, I now feel like an adult. I, I would call myself a man. I went through, uh, an initiation, if that's the word. So now I, I feel different. And I think there's so much of, of my inner child. I still connect, I love him. He comes out to play when we wanna get creative. However, I don't have the same fear responses anymore. When, when uh, the pandemic started, I had zero anxiety. I saw everyone else being in a lot of panic and I thought, okay, well, this means I'm responsible to step up. So I did a lot to support way more than tip, than usual. Um, and it's a funny example, but a week ago I had a cold, like a head cold. It was annoying, um, nothing serious, but my, I was so stuffed up, I couldn't sleep. At three in the morning, I woke up and I started giggling. And the reason I, I, I say that is because if this was two years ago, five years ago, I would have been so panicked thinking, oh my God, how am I going to work tomorrow? What's this going to mean? Uh, what it, it would have been a complete fear response. And now it was a complete love response. So I wanted to share that because I want everyone to feel how I feel now. I just don't know. I can't pinpoint, and maybe there is, obviously it's not one thing, but it's been this journey. So if it happened, if it has happened to me, it can happen for everybody here. And maybe part of this is the, the paradigm of something happening to you versus for you. So David, I'll start with you. What do you think? You've seen all these, you, you've helped yeah. thousands of people. Um, what is the tipping point or what, what is that catalyst that helps create these kinds of transformations? Well, I mean, and you and I have had this conversation before, but but for the the sake of um, everybody here this evening, it's interesting when you talk about suicide because 
a person very often when a person is contemplating suicide, they're the they're in this place where they can't, they're not finding a meaning that is keeping them alive, right? We talked about hope earlier in the in the conversation. And my question to you would be, what changed for you as far as a meaning to actually stay alive versus to follow through with suicide? What changed for you there? At the time, it was my son who was three. And I saw his face, I had a picture of him. And literally, that was the moment I said, there's no way I can do this to him. And that's, that was the original catalyst back then. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, if you think about that, um, that's a very powerful meaning. That's an internal meaning. It's a genetic meaning. There's a lot tied to the idea that, that your son was the catalyst for, for helping you change that. You found something that was more powerful than your pain, than your hopelessness. And I mean, I've known you for quite some time now, and, and I've known that you've grown into the love of yourself, just the things that have changed in your life. I mean, the relationship that you found that is such a reflection of the love of yourself and the, the love for, for each other, for both of you, you know, and there's very few people that I know in the world that love people in general as much as you do. So something caused you to tap into the idea of not just, um, you, so the, the love of your son, but the love of being able to see that love in yourself and then being able to see it in the hope of the world. Because you know as well as I do that there is there's much to look at in the world that can cause us to have a dark view of things, a hopeless view of things. But you look at it and you see you see uh, uh, you see options, you see possibility you see a direction that other people don't see. You see the love in people that don't even see it in themselves. And I think that whatever it was that made that change after your son, I think that's the reason that I think that's the reason why right there. Nicole, what transformations have you seen with the people you've helped? Uh, I mean, the transformations really, really range. Um, what kind of kickstart, you know, whether or not it's this idea of hitting you know, a rock bottom, being on the brink of the hopelessness that would draw one to suicide or whatever it might be, or, right, a gradual, you know, sometimes it's not the big earth shattering thing. Um, it's just a gradual realization that, you know, I'm not feeling fulfilled. I don't know this purpose. I don't have this passion. So I think our entry point really does vary. Um, someone said the word journey. I think our journey, you know, to the, the process of change and then our journey through the process of change is really very individual. Um, and then once we begin the journey of change, I mean, the transformations can, can really span. Um, I think it begins, so just kind of bouncing off this idea of powerless, that's what drives us to those depths of darkness, to this idea of ending my life is the only option. And going back even to this idea of, you know, our lineage and all of these similar symptoms, experiences that we just see repeated over generations, of course, so many of us do end up feeling that hopelessness. We end up becoming an adult who is living very reactively. We almost feel like we have no control left. The world happens, things happen around us. And I'm, again, locked in these responses that I actually can't shift and can't change. In my opinion, that does render us all really, really hopeless, really disempowered. So regardless of what kind of triggers or activates you into the process of change, I think that the first step is rebuilding that power, taking that agency back. And it doesn't happen like a light switch, like I like to say, um, because we don't go from the depths of feeling like I have no control or say in my life because I maybe never had to feeling totally empowered. Absolutely not. But where it begins is a concept that I like to offer, which is through the practice of keeping one small daily promise to yourself. Now, it doesn't matter what that is. I've had people who began their journeys of healing with that promise being, I'm going to drink one glass of water today. Somewhere in my day, that's the promise I'm going to keep to myself. And it doesn't matter whether it's a glass of water, whether it's journaling for five minutes, whether it's waking up five minutes earlier. There isn't, and I do suggest for this way, keeping the promise so small, because it's not actually about the promise at all. What it's about is rebuilding that empowerment. 
is over time beginning to see alignment between what you said you were going to do and what you're doing. Because so many of us have set a million intentions to change. Maybe we have hit rock bottoms before and decided that things are going to be different. And maybe, you know, I kept things different for a couple weeks, you know, a couple months. And then before I know it, because of the pull of our subconscious, we're right back in that familiar. Over time, talk about more disempowerment laid on top of it all. I call it self-betrayal. When I don't show up and keep promises to myself, I do roll my eyes at myself. I don't believe the words that come out of my mouth until I begin to rebuild that. So the journey begins, in my opinion, when we take that step, making that intention, keeping that intention, that over time translates into empowerment. So we don't transform overnight into an agenic being who feels so powerful. But over time, the more you witness that alignment, you start to rebuild a little trust. And then wherever you walk on your journey, you, know, you become a little more confident that you can keep yourself walking in that direction. I think I'm starting to see a pattern and I love patterns. Uh, so you, you're talking about keeping small promises to yourself. David, earlier you mentioned it has to be a behavior change. I remember a quote, I don't know who said this, I just love it so much that it is easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than think your way into a new way of acting. And I wanna understand, David, how do we hack this, the, the nervous system or the subconscious by behaving differently? You know, what's really interesting, Gio, you don't see this behavior in, uh, in nature, right? If you look at, if you look at animals that are, that are unaffected by human beings, um, you, you don't see things like shame. You don't see things like subconsciously stored fear. You don't see stories. Uh, you don't see, you don't see things like the contemplation of suicide and it's fascinating because an animal can have a trauma experience or what we would consider a trauma experience. I remember watching this, this cat come out of a hedgerow. Uh, one time I was living on this golf course in the wintertime, this cat comes out and it's looking for a mouse or something. And this fox sees it and starts chasing it. And I'm watching this, you know, like National Geographic happened right, right outside my window, my window. And the cat, like, oh, come on, cat, come on. And finally the cat gets away, makes it. And the fox goes about doing his thing. The cat goes away. And half hour later, the fox is back, or the cat's back out there again. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, a human being is now going to need 20 years of therapy uh, to get over this trauma experience. And the cat just goes right out there and just does the cat thing. It's back out there living its natural life. And the, the, when you break it down, what it is, is, is that is a combination of the stories that we tell ourselves about the experiences that we have and the stories that other people tell us about the stories that we should tell ourselves. So when those things happen, we automatically just repeat this very interesting behavior that becomes a huge portion of our, of our reality. When we, when we decide we're going to break something, what's fascinating about it is that if we, and, and Nicole Cole was saying this, if you just repeat this to your self-consciously, Nothing changes because your subconscious mind is going, yeah, but this is still what happened. This is still the reality. When you give yourself a new behavior where you're actually getting a completely different result, you're training your subconscious mind to have a different experience and you're training it to have a different experience that you're in control of. So very often with these early childhood experiences, excuse me, these early childhood experiences, we weren't in control of them, or at least we didn't perceive being in control of them. So the belief is then created almost with the intention or the possibility of us being a victim, either a victim to ourself or a victim to something else. We don't have control. It's possible that we're a victim. If we have any kind of victim mentality that runs in our in our neighborhood, or if it runs in our family, we automatically start to absorb that idea. And then we don't have power. 
But when we change it and we make a conscious choice to say, I'm going to love my son, I'm going to love myself, I am going to do this behavior because I'm choosing to do it. I am consciously going to change this pattern or, or approach changing uh, of this pattern and this result. And I, and I do this. What Nicole was saying, the brilliant thing about what she said in my, in my experience is that we do so much to break trust with ourselves over a period of time because we say we're going to do something and we don't follow through. And we have a history of not being able to trust the most important person in our life we should be able to trust, which is ourselves. If we can't trust ourselves. There's no way we can really trust anybody else. I mean, it just becomes a smokescreen in, in our life. It's not real. But what, what she was saying was, if you rebuild this trust with yourself, anything is possible at that point. Because you now know internally, physically, intellectually, that if you say it, it's going to happen, right? You're being your word. And when you do that, there's nothing that you can't accomplish at that point, because you know you. I think, and Nicole, if you disagree, say so, but I think at this point, this is the place where we actually take ownership of who we really are. It's like, yeah, we, st we still have mom and dad. They're still there in, in life, in memory, whatever. But at that point, when I say, this is who I am, this is what I'm going to do, and I follow through and I do it, boom, I've taken ownership of myself at that point. I am my own parent at that, at that point in time. I can trust me. I don't have to now manipulate people in my life to get my needs met because I can get my needs met based on my own commitment to myself. That, that's, that's the way that I think about it. I heard one of the most beautiful definitions of the word confidence probably 15 years ago, where it was simply defined as self-trust, meaning you make a promise to yourself, you keep it, you feel confident. And I think yeah. it, it is, it, like Nicole said, baby steps, meaning you, you make small ones and you keep adding to them. And the more you keep following through with what you say you're going to do, the more you believe in yourself. And I actually think that this is the antidote to things like imposter syndrome. Like, I feel like when people use that phrase, what they're actually saying is, I don't trust myself. And I don't know if I can follow through based on my previous behaviors. And I think, yes, I get you. We've all done stuff where we've made a promise or a commitment, whether it's to other people or to ourselves that we didn't follow through on. And yet we can start from right now and rebuilding it like a, like a bank account and keep making deposits. And I, that's how I've seen this. So I, I have a giant confidence account now. So much deposits <laughs> with, with yeah. and, but also withdrawals, sometimes massive withdrawals where, you know, it doesn't always follow through. And sometimes weird things happen and you can't follow through. And yet I think we can't stop making those deposits to the confidence account. Nicole, how can we leverage the power of community to support this transformation? Because um, in your book, I believe you, you talk about interdependence as a concept, which I don't know if a lot of people understand that. I first heard that word uh, 20 something years ago when I read Stephen Covey's book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. One of the first ever personal development books I ever read that changed my life. And then now that everything I do is based on building community, I feel like there's a secret embedded here where we can leverage connection to support transformation. And I'm curious what you think about that. 100%, and I'm actually gonna tie this to this conversation, right? Around self-trust, um, even tying it back to a conversation we had earlier around safety. Um, I think one of the biggest areas that most of us as, a, as adults lack self-trust outside of not keeping our promises to ourselves are around our own ability to regulate our emotions, our own ability to regulate our nervous system. Going back to what we said earlier, David, our own ability to keep ourselves safe. I think as adults, many of us are lacking that trust that I can engage with an unknown environment. Like we were saying, safety doesn't happen when the world changes around me. Safety happens when I can navigate the world around me regardless of what happens without, and this is how I'm gonna bridge it into interdependence, 
without modifying myself or without asking the world around me or the people around me to change. Because what I believe interdependence means is showing up as a full, whole human who's, I love how beautiful all these concepts connect together, who's connected to my own purpose and passions and my own self-expression in this world. Because interdependence, again, in my opinion, is based in evolution, in the reality that there was a time where we did have different roles. We did foster different talents of different people in our original clans where they you know, lived out their gifts and them doing that supported us, took responsibility off our shoulders back when we were in group living. This idea of individuals that are separate humans that are interconnected, showing up in support of each other and allowing your own God-given talents. And I believe we do all have a purpose, a passion, the thing that makes us us. And when we are safe enough to fully live in that expression, now we can band together. And when our community, this is again, how I'm going to tie this in the community and the importance of community. And when we're safe enough in our community to be self-expressed, then we can evolve into interdependence where we all are showing up in our uniqueness, in our interconnection, because the relationships that most of us find ourselves in aren't ones where we are full and authentic and safe to be us. Chances are more often than not, we're modifying ourselves. We're squashing aspects of ourselves. You might be like me. I have no idea what my purpose or my passion is. So how could I express it? So in that model, most of our then relationships aren't interdependent. They're not whole humans in full safe self-expression. They're actually very need-based and very conditional. And like you said, very much still all of us trying to meet our own needs, sometimes very superficially through service to another. But my argument always is that we're not fully in service to another until we're again in our own full self-expression that allows us to then be a unique human that can actually be deeply connected and gain the value and support of a community that we're all wired for. Because remember, we all needed that in childhood. We are wired to connect with other humans. I think this is why I love the two of you so much, because we all have a similar mission and we all similar, similarly do the same thing where we create that safe space for people to self-express so that they can then go out and live fully. Um, th there's a topic, David, I wanna make sure we cover that I know for many people may even be taboo. And it's our beliefs and values around the concept of money and our relationship to money and how it relates to everything we're talking about today. And I know that you help people, especially in this realm of how they think about money or maybe even how they change the paradigm. Because many people have beliefs that were probably implanted into them as they grew up in the same way they may have these core wounds and fears. So can you share your philosophy here? Yes. <clears throat> so money is a very interesting thing. First of all, it's an idea. Um, but it's an idea that is developed through so social evolution over a period of time that has become extremely important in the lives of individuals because it is the tool that we use um, to replace food and shelter. So if you're looking at it from like a hierarchy of the physical needs that we have, you've got air first, water second, food and shelter is third. And we've replaced that now with money as a tool to be able to get those needs met uh, and to meet those needs of other people. And I remember thinking about it from, from a couple of different aspects. One was, it seemed very strange to me as a child that we would have this massive need, um, and yet so many people were suffering uh, with how to earn it, how to keep it, uh, how to have enough of it, depending on where you were in the world, not being able to have it at all. It seemed very screwed up to me. And I was also at that time in my life, I was being raised um, with some religious construct. I was, I was raised Catholic and I'm coming from the aspect of, okay, you hear you come from a loving God. How does this fit? Right. I'm trying to like, but how does this jigsaw puzzle fit together? And I would ask these questions in the in a proper environment, by the way. And and basically, I would be disciplined because they, 
you know, were really viewing me as somebody that was causing a problem instead of not being able to say they didn't know how to answer the question. <laughs> so I had an experience that really started setting me down this road of trying to figure something out. So I quit high school when I was 17. Um, I got married young. I had two children very young. And my life was a, a turning out to be a disaster because I did not have uh, the ability to live up to the responsibilities that I created for myself. So through, through uh, um, really struggling, really trying to figure this out, I was working two jobs, six and a half days a week. Uh, I was on food stamps. My car was repossessed. I filed bankruptcy. And I had kind of an emotional breakdown one night uh, while I was at work because I worked on a dock. I drove, I drove a forklift. It was working for a food importer outside of Chicago. And I had this emotional breakdown. And um, anyway, make a long story short, in my mind, uh, this voice in my head said, David, change your attitude. And so big part of the problem was that I knew what I wanted to change as far as the result but I didn't know where I was as far as what I needed to start to change. I didn't know that. And nobody around me knew it either. I would ask, how do I change this situation? And they, the response would be, well, you shouldn't have quit high school. And I was like, yeah, I kind of got that one figured out. Now, <laughs> what do I do now? And they couldn't tell me. So when I had this emotional breakdown, I start working on three specific things within my, within my, uh, uh, my attitude that I seriously make a decision, probably the first time in my life that I'm going to change. And, and they were, these were the three things. I'm going to act like I love what I do because I hated what I did every day. And I showed up with that kind of an attitude that I hated it. Um, I was going to treat everybody with total respect because my own self-loathing and anger was coming out on other people extremely inappropriately. And it, it's not who I was, but I was also very emotionally immature. I didn't know how to handle that. And then the third thing was that I, I needed to learn what it meant to do everything to the best of my ability to really apply myself in a, in a great way. So I said, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for a year and see what happens in 30 days. My income tripled. I went from 20,000 a year to 62,000 a year. And there was no reason that this should have happened. So it sends me down this, down this, uh, uh, inquisitive uh, mindset of I need to figure out what happened and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to figure out what happened. So I, I it sends me down a period of studying for seven years, just relentlessly studying. But one of the things that I was floored by was how, not only how easy my income increased, but how fast and by none of the rules that I was taught that you needed to have in place for this to happen. So as I was studying, one of the things that I was doing was I started showing people how to increase their income. And the people that would listen to me, their income would increase. And, and many times it, they would increase way past what, what, what my income was at the time. I didn't have my own, my own business yet. So I started thinking, why would we be, even from an evolutionary perspective, like even if you're an atheist, if you don't believe in spirit or God, if you come straight from an evolutionary perspective, because this doesn't make any sense either way you look at it, why would we create or nature create uh, something that is so vital to our wellness, money, right, for, for, for food and shelter, and it would be so difficult for people to be able to do in an abundant way, and not only that, but even actually have a, a, a respectful, conscious, responsible control over. Made no sense to me. So what I learned over, over a period of time was that basically we were lied to about the idea of money and what it is and how difficult or how easy it is to actually manifest in our life. And the reason for this is because if you can take the things that really control the essence of, a, of who a person is and what's tied to their self-expression and their need in life, 
you can control them forever. And you only need to teach one generation of individuals in order to be able to do this. So I recognized really quick that there were three areas that we were uh, uh, very much manipulated in and, and not given the whole truth. And it was God, sex, and money. And the idea that um, whether you can believe whatever it is that you want about God, but if you're given the wrong information about something that's so important, then you don't understand how that works in your life or how to work with it. Sex, the idea there is it is, it is uniquely tied to our own self-expression and how we feel about ourself. You know, there's nothing in nature that's born with shame and guilt. But you have a lot of people that are taught shame and guilt through religion, you know, and we're taught shame and guilt about our own bodies. And we're taught shame and guilt about sex. Like it doesn't, it doesn't go together, but what it does do is it prevents a person from literally tapping into who they are authentically and not being ashamed, but actually being proud of who they are authentically and literally tapping into their purpose. And then of course, the other thing, uh, the idea is money. So, so here, so here's to, to tie this together. This is what this looked like. I was thinking to myself, why is it that it seems to be so difficult for us to uh, create the amount of money that we need in order to do the things that we want to do in life? And what is it about this that it's tied to that seems to be missing for everybody? And when I recognize that the idea that there's no, there's nothing in nature that is confused about what it is and what it's here to do, right? You don't see the confusion of anything in nature. Like a squirrel doesn't doubt that it's a squirrel, <laughs> right? It, it, it doesn't. And nothing in nature is confused about what it is, nor is anything in nature confused about what its purpose is. Yet human beings who have this marvelous, fantastic intellect can't seem to figure out why we're here or what it is that we're supposed to do. And we spend enormous, sometimes we spend our entire life trying to figure out what this is. Those things are directly connected to what we need, what we need it for, and how we actually bring it into our life. So I began to focus on the idea of how is it that we got so out of sorts with the idea of not understanding who we were? So I recognized that one of the things that we were taught was that our identity was attached to basically what other people thought of us and what we should or we should not do in life. Instead of teaching people how to find out that their identity, their purpose in life is speaking to and through them the way it is for any life form. We just don't know how to listen to it. And the other thing is with money, money is really based on your perception of whether you're not, whether or not you can actually see it or not. Like what is the perception with money? Well, we have a law that really controls perception. It's the, it's the law of polarity. Law of polarity says that there's an opposite side to everything. So if you don't have money, like if your physical experience is your reality that you don't have money, the opposite side of that is that you do have money or that you do have the possibility of bringing money into your life. And somebody will say, well, that's great. I love the way that that law sounds, but you're obviously not looking at my bank account, right? The money's not there. So what happens is that somebody told us based on what we see that that's what the reality is. Instead of understanding how do we use this law to understand who we are and where the money is, everything that we need is here. When you say, I don't have something, the opposite side of it is that it's, that it's here and you do have it. So as you know, one of the things that we do with people, especially with people that are in business, is show them how to use this law for two main things. Number one, to realize that money is the easiest thing for a person to manifest bar none. The lie is that it's hard. There's nothing hard about it at all. But all the lies that we have tied to it, shame, 
It's not okay to be rich. Rich people are greedy. Like you think about all the different scenarios that we've been taught our whole life about the, the, the contradictions with money. Does anybody who's a good person want to be involved in that? Probably not. So we actually don't see what is, what is very real and very easy for us. We're born to be a success. We're born to be successful. Like it would be a, a, a huge error in nature for nature to be creating things that we're not supposed to be successful. Everything about a human being is born to be, a, to be successful. And success is not difficult. Do you see anything in nature struggling to be a success at what it is? No, you don't. You do not see struggling. You don't, you, the other thing you don't see is you don't see suffering, right? So being that we have not been taught how to think, we very much live within those paradigms that aren't true. My experience is that once you show a person how easy it is to bring money into their life at whatever quantity or amount that they want, when you show them how easy it is to tap into what their purpose is, that is an awareness. It's not a memory. They never go back to it again. They never go back to the false belief because the ideas that have been holding them back are not based in truth. They're based in lies. And these are, the, you know, the, the truth is universal. It, it's the same for everybody. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't matter what your skin color is, where you came from in the world, what your gender is. It's based in truth. And when you, and I think that we have inside of us a way to know when we're hearing the truth. It's almost like there's a sense inside of us that says, yep, that's the truth. I don't know how I know it, but I know it. It's like an intuitive knowing of, 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 of when you hear the truth and when you experience it. And once you cross over that line, you, you don't go back. And the truth is, is that there's nothing difficult about money. You're not put here to suffer. You're here to be a smashing success in whatever it is that you're supposed to do. There's no such thing as limitations based on any of the problems that you see in your life. These are all lies that we've been taught. So because that's exactly how they control the masses. There's so much that's tying into this whole conversation and, you know, lies that we were told growing up where the people who told them to us from their perspective was truth as well. And when you're a child, I think everything you're told becomes fact. It's just the way it is because you don't have a frame of reference. And I think as adults, part of, part of our journey is to uncover and discover all of this to question everything and to, to seek uh, universal truth. Like when you said that when, you know, the, the law of polarity, this is not a man-made law. It is a natural law of, of nature. And what, I remember at that dinner, you said, um, I'll try to quote you and you can tell me the exact line. Um, you can't have a desire without the way for the desire to come true. I, I, I talk about dreaming. Like when we dream about a bigger future, we can't actually have the thought without the possibility of the manifestation coming true. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think... Uh, who it was that that said this but basically desire is god's promise uh of your purpose before you get there like it's <laughs> something something like that it has a latin root its etymology is based in either of the father or of the stars it's a little foggy depending on where you pick it up at but it's it's different than wish and want um our purpose speaks to us through our desire and our desire speaks to us through our heart, right? It's the thing that is talking to us as far as what we want to be, do and have in our life. And everybody has a purpose. Everybody has a purpose. It's the thing that gives you the most fulfillment. It's where you find your most joy. It's where you find your most growth and it's in every single person. Nicole, what do you think about this conversation around money? I'm having so many thoughts over here. So, you know, money, and I do agree with David, you know, talking about all of the different layers of meaning that has been assigned to money, even experiential. A lot of us, do, so for my, my own past history, uh, my parents were born in the years 37 and 40. So very much 
post-depression era, right? A lot of it too, our beliefs about money are communicated to us, not only through action, inaction, but direct, indirect. And especially those of us who have come from generations or have lived our, maybe even our own lifetime experiences where we didn't have money, where those needs weren't being met. Again, as I often do, I go back to right, this idea of, of, of trauma. And when our needs aren't met, you know, we are in a, in a trauma response to some extent. And that often happens with money. So many of us can't shift our belief, can't you know, enter into the abundance that we actually do have available to us because we don't have that security, because maybe we did come from parents or did live in experience where there was money that was lacking and the trauma we carry then with us. And again, all of this connects to this idea of purpose and passion. I think a lot about and I've kind of adapted Maslow's pyramid. So for those of you, right, I have my basic physical needs. I have my emotional needs of security. And only then can I, his concept is self-actualized. Only then can I be connected to my purpose and my passion. And again, because of our very real past lived experiences for some of us around money in particular, we don't have that safety. We don't have that security. We actually can't believe that we are capable of that abundance because I very much am in agreement with you, David, that we all have that available to us. A lot of us though are carrying beliefs, are carrying experiences and aren't meeting our needs, don't have that balance within ourselves, aren't whole, aren't authentic, aren't connected to what our purpose and passion is. That idea of desire, I believe the first stepping stone is what do you like? And I could ask that question. I know that question was asked to me about a decade ago around general things. What do I like to do? How do I want to spend Sunday? I honestly had no answer. I couldn't tell you because of my past experience, because of my adaptation, because of my conditioning. I actually never practiced even asking myself what I liked. My mom used to ask me my favorite. What's your favorite color? What's your favorite ice cream? And I would get angry because I didn't have an answer. Oh, mom, stop. Don't ask me what my favorite was. I understand my anger now. I didn't know. So when we talk about desire and purpose, right? Some of us are needing to build that bridge. We're so conditioned to look outside of ourselves, We don't even know what we like. So it feels really overwhelming to hear about all these people with purposes and passions and money and abundance. And I'm over here. I don't know what I want to do on Saturday. So for a lot of us, again, that comes from our past experience, we, we probably are carrying, you know, that lack of safety. Maybe I'm not actually meeting my needs. Maybe I'm not even connected to myself to know what they are. And that's perfectly okay. That's where you are on your journey now to begin to ask yourself, what do I like for some of us? Is that propelling into, okay, what is my desire? And then what is my purpose and my passion to then be the abundant human that I am? Let's time travel, David, now into the future. We've been in the past. <laughs> okay. we, we all want to create a bigger and better future for ourselves. And anyone who's joining us today and listening also wants to create a bigger and better future for other people. I think that's the through line of this community. How can we dream bigger? I think there's, there's, there's a couple of components. One is that we're often afraid to talk about what these desires or dreams are out of fear of what people might say or think. And then we're so conditioned to be limited in how we think about these things. And I want to, I want to break those limitations. So how can we do that? And this is a really good question. Um, and the, one of the interesting things about it is that I was once told uh, by a very brilliant person that there's there's two things that are really required um, for you to create whatever success that you want. And they were fundamental, but they're extremely important. One is, where are you going? What do you want? Which for most people, even at, even at a very basic level, that should be quite easy. Like, you know, if you want to make a little bit more money, if you want to live someplace new, if you want a better relationship, you can usually pick those things uh, up relatively smoothly. The big problem is understanding where you are. And the reason that this is a problem is that 
it becomes very difficult to get anywhere you want to go if you don't understand where you are. For instance, if I put you in a desert someplace and give you a map and tell you to walk to California, if I don't tell you where you are on that map uh, in correlation to, to, to uh, uh, where you're going, you could walk around for the rest of your life and never figure out how to get there. And it, it unfortunately is the thing that people avoid the most. They want the answer. They want the magic answer, the easy answer of how to get from A to B, but they don't really want to know where A is. Wow. And if we would, if we would spend the time just to understand where we are, and it doesn't have to be complicated or difficult. It's really about understanding what are the motivations for the things that we want to do. Because if we're, if we're picking different things that we say that we want in order to provide that false idea of safety, like safety is a destination, then it's actually the antithesis of, of what we say we truly want. So we'll manifest the opposite when we do that, because it's fear motivated, it's fear driven, it's, uh, it's a, a limited perspective, right? So we're building the wrong image. If we would just spend some time trying to figure out exactly where we are or getting some guidance with that, even that can really help because then we can come from a place of purity. Like what is the pure desire of my heart? Not anything that I'm making up, not something that I'm doing because somebody else told me what to do, or this is what they said that I think I should do, or all my life, uh, uh, teachers told me you can't do this. You have to do this because this is what your score is on a test where, you know, if we can, if we would just start by looking at where am I, who am I really so that I can have permission so that I can authentically express myself, then getting to where we want to go becomes relatively easy because it's the lack of authenticity that causes the biggest problem. We end up trying to be, do, or have something that we're not, so we don't have to face shame and guilt or, uh, or any kind of re rejection from people. I mean, that's it, so painful for most people. But when you can accept who you are and you have a real solid sense of saying, here is the authentic expression of myself, then creating what you want is like, there's no limit to it at that point. Nicole, how do you interpret the idea of self-expression? Meaning, how will, how will we all know that we've met ourself? Like, I, I, I'll explain where this comes from. The phrase that I struggled with the most in the past is the phrase, be yourself. Because I would always respond, what the hell does that mean? So how do we know that we've discovered and we've met and we've expressed as ourself? That's a great question. And I think similarly to kind of what we keep spinning back around to around this concept of safety, right? I'm looking outside of myself in that way. It's appealing, right? We're not necessarily looking to find, I think is the language I want to use, the self. We're almost peeling back the layers of the onion, to use that analogy, to rediscover the self that's beneath, to use my language, all of the conditioning, all of the adaptations, all of the way that we're being in the world that isn't connected. I love, David, that you brought up this concept of the heart. Um, in our self-healer circle, my global membership of healing, we had three months recently where we talked about heart consciousness dropping into that heart because that's where I believe our authentic expression lives. So many of us are disconnected from our physical body, let alone our deeper heart space that we might've heard of that concept of intuition. Oh, we all have one, sure. I don't even know what mine sounds like, or maybe I do have the inklings. I do have some urges that I might, you know, could be whisperings of my intuition. Though, if I'm that person, like we were talking about earlier, who's self-betrayed, who doesn't trust myself, chances are I don't trust what my heart is saying. So when we align ourselves to our heart, for a lot of us, that means just hitting pause on all of the endless distractions that exist outside of ourselves and taking a moment or two throughout our day to even cultivate a reconnection with me, me outside of my thoughts, because that's our first layer of distraction. When any of us sit in silence, 
before bed is often when this happens. If we have no stimulation, what happens? Our mind is running. Again, that's not our heart space. That's narrative, that's stories, everything we've been talking about. Again, colored by our past, affecting our present. So even the moments where we think we're being silent because we're not looking at our phone or no one's around us, if we're lost in our thinking mind, again, we're still not in that heart space. So the power of self-expression comes when we're in that alignment. And what alignment means for some of us begins, I should say, for some of us, when we create space to reconnect, to discover how it feels for you. So I'll share for me, I know I'm me when that flow state, some of us might've heard of it, when I'm just present, when the thing I'm doing is naturally the thing that has my attention, when I'm just speaking because the words are seemingly coming out of me, I'm in alignment because I'm connected to me. And that's what's coming out. I'm not filtering. I'm not monitoring. I'm not watching your face to see if you like what I'm saying or thinking about how I misspoke that word 10 minutes ago. So maybe I shouldn't use that same word again here. I'm just in expression, right? For me, it also feels like when I drop into my body, I can feel whether or not I'm interacting with someone that expands me. I feel a lightness. I almost feel excited to have a conversation or to continue the conversation. Maybe I'm even lost in it. Time goes away and I'm just talking with this human. That's quite different, again, by contrast to maybe if I'm interacting with the person, I start to feel constricted. I start to have racing thoughts and fear what I'm saying. All of those are signals for me. So again, to learn your own signals to all of you on this call here today, sometimes begins with us carving the space out to tune in to not our mind, but our bodies by focusing our attention away from the thoughts that probably will be endlessly distracting, really toning, I call it a muscle of attention because we do get choice. We can sit in quiet, have a thought come just like the clouds in the sky and refocus our attention back to our body. And the more we practice doing that, the more you'll be able to have the lived experience of what I'm talking about, hearing your heart. And then of course, the next expanded practice is living from that space, despite the reactions around you. So beautiful. Last, I guess, theme or topic before we wrap up, David. Um, and it's based on, I guess, the state of the world over the past maybe year or two around how fear is being used in a form of manipulation and control. And I want to understand how can we see through the control on the opposite side of fear so that we don't have to feel or be affected by that type of fear. Well, I think the, I think one of the, the first things that we have to understand is that everything that is coming at us is, is coming from an agenda. Uh, you know, just basically when you're looking at the news of any kind, uh, there's an agenda, it's a business and people are, uh, their job is to get more eyeballs and they get more eyeballs by selling fear. Uh, and, um, the more fear that they can sell the more eyeballs they can get And it. You will find that there are any, so here's one of the things that I am always highly suspect of anything that is promoting fear instead of understanding is in my mind is manipulation. There is no reason why any of the things that we're going through as a world right now cannot be dealt with, with love and compassion and understanding instead of fear and manipulation. When it's fear and manipulation, it's somebody's agenda. So that's, that's when you have to really, you have to decide for yourself what's right for you and what you need to look at in order to find things out um, so that you're understanding what the, what the truth is. I also believe that so much of the fear that is being propagated right now is coming from a lack of understanding, period. I think we've lost our way. Uh, it's like I said earlier, we're a world without a purpose. Uh, we, 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 the, the purpose is, the purpose is to defeat the other person and to make people wrong. And, uh, somehow or another, people think that 
that's where their individual purpose is because they don't have one. When we don't, when we do not understand our own, our own uh, personal purpose, it is human nature to glom on to anything that makes us feel alive and safe. And there's, even if it's craziness, right? There's numbers there. I feel, uh, I feel in somewhat in control. If I, if I feel anxious, I can find someone to blame. Somebody else is causing me to feel this way. There's a bunch of people over here on this news station that's saying that, yes, it's those people that are making me feel this way. So it is, it, if, if people had an individual purpose, if they had a reason for doing the things that they wanted to do, we would not see this. We wouldn't tolerate it. I mean, the only reason it's existing is because we're tolerating it. We're tolerating it because we're believing in the fear. We have to disengage from the fear and we have to say enough is enough. And we have to take back our world and we have to start dealing with it from love and compassion and get people in places of leadership that are dealing from what is a sane, solid purpose to be able to lead our world. Because it's not just our country. It is the entire world is, is gone into a crazy spin. And, you know, the, the, the thing with COVID is that when I saw this happen, one of the things that I was concerned with the most was that it's going to create a situation where there's so many people alive today that don't know what it's like to go through a really difficult time in history. And it's not something that's being taught all that much in, in history, like, like in, in school. So they're very susceptible to believing whatever it is somebody tells them is, is actually happening. Uh, and that's dangerous. That's dangerous because we're all wired to, to understand how, we get the things and get our needs met. And when that starts to change, what ends up happening is that we, our vulnerability comes out. And if our vulnerability comes out, it can be manipulated very easy. And that's exactly what we see happen. So when stuff goes wrong and we see people hyper reacting to things that go wrong, like things in life going wrong, we know that that's the reason why it's, it, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's confusion. It's craziness. Uh, that's being misdirected it, because people don't know what to do with it. Nicole, how can we shift from fear to love? Let me unmute myself first. Um, I believe at our core, we are compassionate humans. When we're connected to our heart space, that is what we are. That is the being we are. We are, as far as I say it, and this might sound woo, we are love. Whenever we're not behaving from that place, we're reacting from fear, we are in a threat state. And I see the whole collective at this point, whether it's because of the trauma that was COVID for many of us, having our lives ripped out from under us, maybe even beginning to suffer financial insecurity, actual threat to our lives, to our livelihoods. Anytime we're reacting in fear, we're reacting from that trauma. Anytime we're not being compassionate, it's in my opinion, because we're disconnected from who we truly are. So in my opinion, and the reason why I show up every day on social media and I have my self-healing circle, I believe that the way out, the way we heal as a collective is by each of us showing up, doing the work to heal the trauma that for many of us lives in our bodies, prevents us from being able to access that compassion, to access that abundance, to access our purpose, our passion, our love. And as we heal and we begin to access that point, then we become compassionate. We become interdependent and the world heals. We're only fighting our neighbors and hostile to those around us when we feel like we need to be to survive. So when we heal and we return, in my opinion, to our heart, and then we begin to live in that love, that is my opinion when we become the domino that helps the world around us and the people around us do the same, because I believe that is what we are. As humans, we are, when we are connected to our heart, we're connected to that core of compassion, of understanding, and ultimately of love for another. Nicole, David, it has been such a privilege and honor and a pleasure hanging out with the two of you. I look forward to hanging out in real life very soon. 
Uh, thank you so much for today. It's been epic. Now that you've discovered the path to overcoming your kryptonite, it's time to unleash your inner superhero. Every hero has an origin, the first step towards becoming the superhero you were destined to be. And you, my hero friend, have your own kind of superpower. For too long you've been told your gift is a curse. Others around you have tried to suppress it or tell you it doesn't belong in this modern age. We're here to tell you that it's time to embrace it. See you next time as our next set of guides will show you how to become a real life superhero.